Hello and welcome. My name is Ron Soto and I'm here today to speak to you about detection challenges in Cloud Connected credential abuse attacks. So let's get started. My name is Ron Soto. I've been in the industry for around 10 or 15 years. I used to work at uh, Prolexic, currently working as uh, Principal Security Research Engineer Splunk. And like I said before, I used to work at Prolexic, then I worked at Caspita, uh, a little bit of time in Akamai. Uh, I co-founded Hack Miami and Pacific Hackers. I also created my own CTFs, and some of them you may have heard of them. One of them was Command and Control, and the other one is um, no quarter CDF. So let's let's talk the, a little bit about this. How the cloud permeates or permeates inside the perimeter. I, I think it's uh, pretty clear at this point. In uh, many environments, even in small businesses, uh, where I myself I used to be a system engineer have my own little IT company and I used to actually install Microsoft SMB server. I remember setting up exchanges uh, which um, it sounds crazy but yeah I used to set up exchange servers in uh, offices of 12 to 15 to 20 people uh, or even crazier things such as a Blackberry uh, enterprise server as uh, small businesses so because that's basically that was the, the way things were supposed to go and we didn't have the evolution of the cloud nowadays you really don't need a domain controller for example in small businesses um, in many large enterprises you you still do although we see things such as uh, Okta uh, taking over a lot of the, uh, the the market but basically as you can see here uh, even Microsoft uh, has made a, a huge move into the cloud. So we have Office 365, Exchange Online. You no longer need to have a uh, Microsoft SMB server uh, or a, an Exchange server. Um, or uh, if you don't want Microsoft, uh, you can have pretty much um, most of it uh, by using Google Apps. And then you can have email, presentation, messenger, telephony, video, conference, you name it. So these are some of the examples of how the cloud now gets into uh, inside the perimeter. Many of those old servers, many of those uh, infrastructure, uh, which uh, some of them ref referred now as mutable uh, infrastructure, have gone away the uh, infrastructure at the cloud level is referred as immutable where usually the providers uh, basically uh, apply the setup and um, updates and patches to it. Um, you can also see uh, in this slide that I actually placed a graph where uh, are other examples of things that we use almost on a daily basis, such as uh, uh, code repositories, for example, like GitHub or GitLab, or we have things um, that we use for uh, deployment of technology or development of software, such as uh, Circle CI uh, or any other uh, technology uh, that is uh, applied to the same end goal. So here's an example of uh, basically uh, how the cloud and the uh, perimeter uh, can basically uh, merge together. We're going to talk about uh, the uh, what we call a converged perimeter and in this case we're looking at two couple of examples. In this example we're looking at Amazon Transit Gateway or Azure. Being it. As you can see here, 
we basically are uh, seeing environments where uh, this type of service basically um, allows the cloud real estate uh, to be part of your perimeter and for all intents and purposes for your users this is invisible they may be placing code saving code moving files uh, doing all kinds of operations uh, logging into a server by SSH um, copying files across the WAN uh, pushing updates and basically uh, they won't be able to realize that some of those instances that they are interacting with are actually not part uh, of uh, your formal perimeter. They are indeed leased uh, property, or leased or rented property, if you want to call it, uh, from the cloud providers. So in this case, uh, are two clear examples of how this can happen. This can also happen in an informal way, which I will cover later on in this presentation. For example, I call this the, <laughs> the hot potato. Why? Because there's always seems to be a not, not a clear idea. It's very clear for the providers, but for the customers, uh, it's almost like a hot potato. Uh, is it mine? Is it not? Did I pass it around? Um, the truth is that many of these uh, providers do have a line they, they draw into what your responsibility is as a customer that have um, uh, plenty of uh, cloud real estate and what they provide to you. And depending on the service model, we know some of the service models uh, or the most popular service models from the cloud providers are things such as um, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service, uh, in contrast with on-premise, which is basically when you own by uh, everything. You have it in a way where um, you can do whatever you want. But once you start mixing up these things, you have to be alert and be conscious that some of this stuff um, you may just not leave it to the provider. There, there seems to be this false notion that because, for example, we're talking about, like I said before, immutable uh, uh, infrastructure where many times the cloud providers do actually a great job uh, updating and hardening the resources. That still does not guarantee uh, the fact that this uh, infrastructure can be vulnerable or can be attacked. I'll give you an example. Uh, many years ago, there was something called um, Hardbleed, and I was working on a company that uh, basically we're looking at 30% um, of the internet at times, and what happens is then the amount of servers, even with embargo, I repeat, even with embargo, because we were uh, within an organization where uh, there were embargoes for disclosure of such vulnerabilities. And this in particular was uh, under embargo. Even with the time of embargo, the amount of service we had to patch, it was almost impossible to finish it in time. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying this is because these things happen and will continue to happen. So when you have uh, number of different technologies. You may have containers that run Alpine, for example. You may have servers that run Ubuntu. You may have uh, Windows servers out there as well, uh, which you can set up on Amazon or on Azure. Uh, definitely, uh, it adds to to the mix. It adds to the, the, the attack surface uh, considerations. And in scenarios like this, um, even as these things are mutable, even as um, the cloud providers do their best to protect them and harden them, uh, you're still responsible for it, that your data is yours. Applications that are running in there that may be attacked as well because they, are, they, are, they became vulnerable uh, because of the disclosure or even a zero day. Th th these are uh, your responsibilities. Uh, and these are uh, some of the um, considerations that we're going to see today as I uh, walk you through some of the attacks uh, that I uh, was able to research uh, during this year and how to address them. 
So coming back to this, right, uh, we are talking about a uh, converged parameter. Converged parameter is basically the cloud real estate that you're using, leasing or whatever form of commercial use uh, that you're, you're doing or you're giving it, uh, plus your perimeter. The perimeter technically ends either in the border uh, or your WAN uh, or your internet gateway or routers. And then once you have things such as the examples I uh, just gave you, then you have a converged perimeter. You basically, if, we, if we're if we looking back at uh, this figure where you have uh, real estate from a provider plus your perimeter and your users are formally or even informally uh, accessing cloud resources, then what this means is basically that this is part of your perimeter. It's a converged perimeter even though you are leasing or renting uh, cloud real estate. So um, the reason why I named it like this is because we uh, are going to look at certain type of attacks, which is basically an abuse of uh, reuse credentials, which is how Microsoft has looked at it. And the reason why this happens, uh, and, and, and hence the title of this slide, is because basically when you have, as I am bringing you up in my past slides, disparate technologies, right? All kinds of operating system versions, all kinds of applications. You need passage through this uh, entities for many reasons functionality um, continuous delivery continuous integration uh, deployment of technology uh, you need mechanisms or uh, in this case uh, tokens or credentials or secrets that allow you to establish authentication authorization um, and some sort of a, a trust in in these infrastructures uh, that are now more complicated because you have a converged perimeter and you have to interact with all kinds of disparate technologies. So, yeah, uh, it is a feature. These secrets, these uh, uh, tokens or, or certificates, for example, uh, you may have uh, federation services, which we're going to look at uh, later on. Uh, you can use also certificates for, uh, for um, uh, authentication. Uh, are things that uh, are used to facilitate the operation and passage. Many times of uh, data, many times of code, uh, many times of, of uh, deployment of technology. So uh, here's where we are focusing at this point because obviously uh, these are the, the key elements that we're going to be looking at because by obtaining this type of secrets, tokens, certificates, uh, attackers can do a lot. So, uh, coming back from uh, what I just said, when you are in a federated environment and you use this type of uh, technologies, obviously, as you can see it here, is a graph where basically we are looking at disparate technologies, but this di disparate technologies can indeed communicate. Uh, by using, uh, let's say, you can use a federation, for example, where you use either OAuth tokens or you can use SAML, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a mechanism of basically uh, authenticating between entities. And what this shows here is that this is the realities of what we're facing today when we're looking at the interaction of cloud technologies and all kinds of um, uh, operating systems, mobile systems, uh, remote offices, you name it. You need something that will allow the interaction, operation, and passage. Uh, and most of all, you need uh, the users at the end of the day, the operators, to use efficiently technology. Uh, if we were to put or force, for example, uh, multi-factor authentication, for example, 
uh, between many of these internal systems and external systems every time, this basically will become uh, suboptimal and, and, and basically all the benefits that we, use, we, we take from things such as continuous delivery, continuous integration, or even deployment of technology, that, that basically nulls it. That basically uh, will slow it to a point where you have to consider is this even worth it. So let's look at some key points of federated environments since we're going to be talking about abuse of uh, cloud-connected federated environments. Uh, things uh, that we need to look at are, for example, uh, formal connections uh, of perimeter and cloud real estate resources, what I call the converged perimeter. Uh, they help. This, 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 the reason in, 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 uh, um, to bring it up uh, in a way of what, wh why is it that we're looking at federated environments and why are they important? Well, they, they, they allow the increase of cloud utilization. So as we said before, move on, move on uh, on-premise resources to the cloud. Uh, the increased uh, this uh, utilization also provides the ability to increase uh, the resource availability or even geographical reach. We're talking about what they call Silicon Valley um, elastic technologies. You can expand or shrink as you need it. Uh, you don't have to have a local data center, or you can have the, the minimum you can have inside the perimeter, but take advantage of this, and this obviously is not the same thing to use or uh, to create environments that you may need at the moment and then pay for usage. That, that, that is a wonderful thing that has helped a lot of companies. And like I said before, uh, we're looking at uh, standards that allows the passage of data, identification, authentication. And that's why we're looking at things such as tokens, certificates, um, even passwords, uh, and API keys, of course. Formal federations um, are usually the ones where there is a uh, to put it in a certain way, a formal technology in place that I, I identifies and authenticates entities between each other. Uh, and that implements, obviously, a stricter uh, control of access of these resources uh, and facilitates the use of it, like uh, single sign-on, for example, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the GUI level and at the user level. But you can also have what I call informal federations. Informal federations are places where, because of the usage of so many cloud technologies and the state of at rest, credentials, secrets, certificates, API keys that are inside your perimeter, for example, by developers, even though you don't have a formal federation, an attacker, if such attacker access those resources, they can be brought into the cloud. And in, even in some cases, depending on how your setup is, they can even be brought from the cloud to your perimeter. And that's what we're trying to focus here today, that we had to understand the risks of the expansion, the, the, um, the subject of the converged perimeter. So the converged perimeter risk scenarios, some of them, uh, obviously we have credential leakage in public repositories. We have, for example, use of vulnerable components from cloud, like for example, open source libraries or containers. Usually download it, embed it, they go through uh, either for deployment uh, because they're hosting a database or they're hosting an application that's needed or uh, in some cases in development where uh, they had the perfect environment to host uh, a specific application or a specific API that's needed. They don't get scanned, they get downloaded from public places and there's, that is a big risk. You can also uh, take a look at the exposure of cloud apps uh, and infrastructure uh, that may lead to uh, internal access. Uh, and um, I will give you an example of a, of a campaign 
uh, or several campaigns actually rather that we have observed where uh, where specifically this scenario um, interesting enough provided from cloud to internal access um, the reuse uh, of federated credentials uh, the attacks such as the golden SAML uh, discovered by CyberArk uh, or things so, such as uh, OAuth token hijacks uh, or pass the cookie for example we'll, we'll see some examples of it with actual examples uh, and then uh, we can see uh, in the case of federations uh, pivoting from cloud providers uh, from one cloud provider to the other uh, I actually seen that I researched it uh, and then from there, uh, try to um, uh, move into the converged perimeter, the internal resources. So here's some of the examples of um, cloud-connected credential abuse. Um, here's a, 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 an attack, uh, which is not that difficult. Uh, what you see on the top left is uh, Mimikatz uh, that was uh, run against a Windows host. Um, and then on the right, you see uh, for um, purposes of uh, proof of concept, you see how I was not logged in. I downloaded or rather discovered or reveal uh, Mimikatz against a uh, Windows host. I was able to get the, uh, the specific cookie um, then uh, via the, the same bra browser functionality uh, inserted a cookie and there I was I was able to basically log in back uh, this is not new but uh, it still works uh, I did it recently and this is something that can be done by somebody that has the possibility of uh, um, access to in this case an endpoint so uh, this is uh, the first example Here's a second example, which uh, was part of the research I did with uh, Jenko Wong from Netscope. And here, uh, Jenko actually did an, an amazing job uh, by uh, identifying uh, things such as the uh, OAuth uh, talking hijack from GCP. Uh, basically, as you can see in uh, this slide, you can extract the token. And then once you extract the token, this can be done basically by either access to an endpoint or uh, physical possession of a device that has obviously the SDK uh, or the, uh, the CLI for GCP and then all what you have to do is refresh the token and just so you know MFA does not protect against this because if the token has been authenticated already you can keep refreshing it for example there's another case scenario uh, of uh, OAuth tokens uh, hijack here's a uh, one that had a lot of uh, um, um, uh, I guess uh, chatter uh, due in part because of uh, uh, its use in in the uh, apparent use in the campaign uh, during uh, solar winds, uh, according to CISA. And uh, here's the the I took this uh, graph from this uh, Signia advisory. Uh, CyberArk did also an amazing job, and one of the researchers uh, actually created a tool that uh, basically extracts uh, the SAML assertion, uh, creates a forged SAML assertion, and then passes it. So once you do that, uh, as you can see in this uh, graph, this is a federated environment, and in this federated environment, we have basically likely a domain controller, and in this domain controller, we have Active Directory Federation Services. You set up a uh, uh, federation uh, and then from there uh, you communicate and make it easy for your users to basically use either Office 365 or Exchange Online um, and what happens is if you're able to basically um, forge 
uh, and it's not easy, I have to say that, it's not easy to forge it. Um, the, the providers have gotten very smart. Um, they have become uh, especially very restricted on the attributes because that's where you can change things as, as, such as the duration or uh, the, the user. Uh, so when you look at the SAML assertions, there, there are things such as attributes and then these attributes are usually checked uh, based on the identity provider basically uh, to prove uh, in, in, in a certain way uh, before that they uh, you're allowed access um, and the reason why this attack was so successful is because if you this can still happen by the way if you are um, taking SAML assertions uh, not likely with these providers. These providers actually uh, make it very difficult for you to do a, a sort of a golden SAML attack. But if I know that there are other uh, open source and other uh, even internal cloud setups, and you are not uh, strict on the checking of uh, SAML assertion attributes, uh, this attack will work. And it's very dangerous because it basically allows access uh, to every single resource that um, is dependent on uh, the interaction with such assertion. So here's another uh, tool that obviously had to do, uh, although it's a tool that is ran against um, a uh, likely uh, active directory environment, however, can provide a lot and may work uh, in federated environments. Uh, let's, uh, coming back to the industry, Microsoft is still the leader. Microsoft is, uh, for the most part, the enterprise operating system, uh, Active Directory, and um, there are tools such as ADFS dump, which are, uh, not only you have to compile them every time you run them, which makes it uh, incredibly difficult to detect but um, they are um, uh, great at obtaining uh, keys uh, that will help you forge uh, certificates or um, uh, even um, uh, use these keys to um, forge sessions or make requests for further uh, identification and recon of uh, the Active Directory uh, environment where you are. So these are things that uh, you had to consider because uh, are very hard to detect. And uh, we do have um, a little bit of a, uh, a way of, of sort of uh, um, looking at this from a certain perspective. However, there is not a silver bullet against tools like this. So here's a, a um, like I told you before, uh, some of the actual um, campaigns that we have seen, uh, whereas um, you go uh, basically full circle. Um, and how you go full circle? Well, okay, so let's say you have exchange online, or you have, uh, yeah, exchange. Let's start with exchange. Let's let's uh, let's say you have an exchange online. Uh, you can uh, many times we've seen uh, uh, environments where there is no multi-factor authenticator or authentication. So uh, credentials. Actually, remember we talk about federated Active Directory, right? Passage, authentication, identification through all many environments. So. We have, for example, a exchange online, right? We have tools that can, we don't even need tools. We can actually, if this, is, for example, was a, a misconfigured exchange server, you can actually use PowerShell to, to elicit a response that will give you a server directory information, usernames, in some cases even uh, depends upon how it was configured, uh, um, way, way uh, a bunch of information that may allow you to target users 
or you can just simply try to brute force, brute force it. And let's say you're able to brute force it, and because this is obviously a federated Active Directory environment, most likely the user uh, repeats. It's the same password for all their services. So all you need to do next is to find the VPN of this company or RDPs or servers that might be uh, exposed to the internet. So you are uh, technically able to log in uh, because you have obtained the password, right? So you have obtained the credentials, uh, you were able to log in and exchange online, you were able, there are other tools that you can use or even do it via PowerShell and obtain foreign information uh, depending on what level of privileges uh, you were able to obtain these user credentials and this user in particular um, and then from there um, you can attack log in and attack uh, extract further credentials use things such as um, imicats for example uh, we looked at it in the past the cookie uh, example or ADFS dump which we also looked at and then forge credentials and then here's the full circle you go back to the cloud now you're in um, GCP you're in uh, AWS you're in an Azure and this is what I wanted to bring up to your attention today this is happening right now uh, unfortunately uh, many times the expansion of the cloud and the connection of such cloud uh, that has brought a lot of benefits you know nothing better that you know, I go the old times. I went to my old OUA. I remember I used to put all the UAs with no, <laughs> with no multi factor authentication or even VPN. It was, it was seen as how cool we can access it and check our email. We don't have to go into the office, right? That was that was actually the, the, the original purpose of this thing. So, well, there the times have changed, and these things can no longer be exposed to the internet without some sort of protections. Um, or uh, we've seen actually cases where um, hard-coded keys, API keys, passwords, and um, uh, a code uh, had led to uh, breaking through uh, either VPN. Uh, this happened, this just happened, by the way. This happens at Colonial Pipeline. They broke in by a VPN that didn't have multi-factor authentication. Uh, or you can even exploit the VPN, uh, like it has happened sometimes. Uh, and um, there are, and I can tell you this, uh, 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 because I see it and I've seen it, there are tons of RDP servers that don't have multi-factor authentication, and many of them are federated. And with that, then obviously you just have to execute your tools the best to your ability and then uh, if you wanted to be in the perimeter, uh, either because you access via VPN or by RDP, then you can expand further into whatever real estate uh, cloud properties these vulnerable environments have, um, which could be in any of the, uh, the uh, main providers uh, that we all know uh, and we're aware of. So as you can see, it's almost like a circle. You can go full circle. Um, and now, um, let's say I was able to get in into, or even break, and let's, let's look at the other side. Let's say I was able to break into a, ser a logging server that is part of a connected, formally connected uh, uh, environment by one of those services that we just talked about. You will be able to basically uh, access servers or, or, or even uh, endpoints that will be reachable uh, because of this extended uh, uh, network and converged perimeter. So um, this is basically uh, something that complicates uh, the current situation that we have and sometimes it gets even more complicated with, uh, with, where lines are not clear uh, of ownership between the providers uh, and the clients and now uh, we're seeing an increase in this type of attacks that obviously require the use of um, federated uh, cloud-connected environments, which, which I would say are the, the perfect environment to do these types of attacks. 
All right. So with that in mind, how do we approach these attacks? Is there anything we can do? Yes, we can do, uh, we can do a lot. We can approach these attacks, and this is something that has uh, hopefully has started to happen uh, in many enterprises, but because bringing back what I said initially, but because there, there's this false notion that somehow your provider is going to protect you, or you don't have to worry about it, it was not very clear. And it didn't help, to be honest. And this was one of the things that I realized as I was doing my research. Uh, the cloud providers, they want you to stay with them as far as analytics and as far as uh, um, uh, even obtaining logs from them is uh, incredibly difficult. Uh, it, was, uh, it has become easier lately. But before, it was uh, like talking different languages, uh, schemas, uh, and that poses a challenge for system admins, for uh, AWS administrators, Azure administrators. Uh, there is, it, companies are trying to avoid uh, marrying to a single uh, vendor. So when every single vendor does not want to play with the other, all what this does, unfortunately, I have to tell you because I've seen it myself, is impairs the security of the customers because when you have a, a, an environment that has multiple vendors, the best way is for all of them to collaborate. The, the best way for all of them is to provide uh, the easiest way to uh, visibility into their environments. And that's what I'm trying to approach here. The approach that we need here is we already know we can observe uh, and analyze the endpoint. Right? So we'll give you some of the things that I've seen uh, in related or associated in these attacks. Things such as the, the extraction of certificates or keys, uh, tools like the certutil.exe, um, on common processes running in servers, uh, all of a sudden that may give away, for example, the user ADFS dump. Uh, things such as uh, registration or or um, uh, registry keys, rather, uh, used for privilege escalation, or the use of minicats, which, uh, uh, for the most part, a lot of the vendors can detect uh, pretty good. And then we can take a look at the cloud providers. And in this, uh, uh, when we look at cloud providers, uh, obviously we had to we had to focus on the specific of every technology. Right? There are no universal technologies for federations. Um, some of the standards, like the, the SAML and the OAuth, are being used for, by uh, these providers. However, the products themselves use them in different manners. That is why I'm putting some examples there of some of the things that we look at, and, and I'm about to show you uh, things that are even more specific that we believe uh, will help you detect these attacks because it's challenging. I can tell you, if we take away one side of this slide, you will not be able to detect this. You will not. Like the pass, the pass the cookie, for example, or the off. I look at both logins uh, from the login perspective. It looks like anybody. And sometimes you can use, for example, security groups, uh, even using security security groups. Uh, depending on uh, um, the policies that you have, uh, you may not be able to see it. Uh, and even worse, if you don't have visibility at the endpoint level. So as we have expanded uh, into a converged perimeter, we need to expand our visibility, and that includes the cloud real estate. So we have things that we need to look at and we need to get alerts for it. If you don't, if you're not getting alerts, like for example, if you have an Ultra 65 that has excessive lowland errors, then you're missing out. You, you, you may be under attack right now and you don't know. But consider this, if you have an Ultra 65 from a federated server where, where passwords are repeated, then the, the scenario that I just gave you, it is likely to occur. It's even worse as we go higher in privileges. Do you have uh, sub admins? Do you have admins per one or admins per uh, land segments? I, I seen that uh, layers of administrators. Uh, these are things that you had to consider 
that if they get compromised, they may indeed provide access to all these resources. Here's a, um, a breakdown of the actual uh, detection searches that we uh, um, in my I, I developed this with my with my teammates at the Splunk Threat Research Team, um, and this is part of what we do. Uh, so here are some of the TTPs that we're looking at endpoint. For example, they use a cert util.exe, uh, which basically allows you to see the, the execution of it, uh, which is usually very rare. This is not something that happens commonly. Um, on common processes, an endpoint, uh, which uh, may give you um, uh, the presence of the execution of tools such as uh, ADFS uh, dump, for example. Uh, registry keys used for privilege escalation uh, and persistence. Uh, this is uh, uh, T1546012. Um, then we have things such as Mimikatz, which is we can detect pretty good. This is uh, credential access, uh, uh, which is T1003.001. Uh, um, this is obviously a MITRE. Uh, TTPs, and we even have a no one that is actually uh, mimicant by a PowerShell uh, in event code uh, 4703. Remember, for you to have this, you need a sysmon policy and you need a GPO that would allow you to get the event IDs that you need. Most of these event IDs are not audited by the phone. So you need visibility, but the visibility requires several steps. Just like the cloud, you have to select a, uh, sometimes you need to sort of sync your log somewhere and then they need to get uh, picked up by some servers and then sense it somewhere else. And uh, this this can be actually cumbersome. Uh, you have to do your homework at the end point as well. You have to have uh, a, a, a strict sysmon policy with all these consequences, you know, there will be a lot of logs. Um, they may have to be rotated. Uh, there's a log life, log life cycle that you that have to consider. And of course, with uh, uh, EVTX type of auditing, you have to know the right GPOs and uh, uh, apply them. And, and after that, obviously, you need a place to retrieve this. It doesn't have to be a spook. It can be EOK or any other uh, SIM you can build your own sim, right? But the bottom line is the events will be the same. And the logs will be the same. So let's move on and now let's take a look at the actual cloud um, TTPs. So for example, uh, we have things such as AWS SAML access by provider, user, and principal. Uh, we have, uh, this one is a giveaway, AWS SAML of the update entity provider. This is usually when some of the uh, attributes are modified. This is something that is not very common and that you should have an alert for. Uh, and it needs obviously to be locked properly. Um, you have things such as uh, excessive single sign-on log on errors, um, service principal in O365, that's also uh, an event in itself that needs to be a monitor uh, or the addition of a service principle that's also an event that needs to be uh, um, uh, considered an event to be monitored by itself. Uh, and of course, uh, all 365 new federated domain. Remember when I told you about pivoting from cloud to cloud? I was able to do that by, uh, by basically adding a new federated domain. Uh, so uh, these are the type of uh, detections uh, that will give you a way to address uh, the abuse uh, of um, federated um, credential abuse. So here's a, a, an example of a, um, a search I created uh, at, uh, using uh, SPL code in Splunk. And basically what this does is give you, obviously, a deleted stuff. So, um, or rather sanitize it, not to give away uh, s s some of the, the sensitive stuff in it. But basically what you get here is when somebody went and said, hey, let me change the, uh, 
the SAML provider. And that was me, by the way, trying to replicate some of the attacks. Um, and um, this is a way to not only uh, investigate, but in combination with all of the other searches at the endpoint and at the cloud level, then we can get a very good visibility. Not saying we will detect 100% of everything, but we get a good shot uh, of detecting this type of uh, uh, attacks, uh, the, the abuse of federated credentials in cloud-connected environments. Here's another example. Uh, you can find this if, if you're interested, if you're uh, interested in looking more at the code. We have a GitHub where you can actually see the actual code and this can be translated into other technologies and uh, other languages. Uh, but again, I'm just showing how this translates into that technology. And just like I showed you the attacks, I wanted to show you uh, the detections and the investigations. And with that in mind, um, I'd like to thank you for coming today and watching this talk. And uh, we're going to open for Q&A. Remember, you can find me at uh, rodsoto.net. My Twitter is uh, rodsoto. And if you have any questions, please let me know. You can uh, email me as well at rod at rodsoto.net. And I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you.